There are times in your life that you may be faced with tough decisions. This is not one of them. It's that time, just in time for a fresh batch of cookies out of the oven. Lace up your trousers and get ready for some jokes. From Los Angeles, California, it's the Brian Crow Show. Bow, bitches. was slightly heavy. Hey everybody. Thanks for tuning into another episode of the Brian Crow show. I appreciate you coming to hang out. Uh, and I'm going to open up this show with a question for you. Are you a geek? Are you? Are you a geek and you know it? Are you a geek and you don't know it? Are you in a geek and, and, and you're in the closet about it? I asked this question because I'm sitting here right now with the biggest geek I've ever met in my entire life. Wow, what a compliment. Yeah, and I'm fiercely proud to call him my friend. Uh, this is Mr. Patrick, Patrick Estrada, the host of Geek Speak TV right here on KXSR. And again, one of the biggest geeks I've ever met. So let me ask Thank you sir. something. Yeah. Um, what is a geek? What is What would you describe as the definition of a geek? Oh, this is, that's a heavy one. That's yeah. A heavy one. Yeah, oh, we, 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 wow. no softballs here on the Brian Crow Show. Oh, they're going straight for the heavy stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. so... Well, actually, I actually talked about this earlier on, on my show. A geek is, there's a class of, okay, people tend to lump geeks and nerds together, mm -hmm. which I constantly, it doesn't that it bothers me, it's just that it's incorrect, in my opinion, to lump us into one big group, because we're not Why? We're not the same. Um, nerds carry a certain level of intelligence, not to say that geeks aren't intelligent, but nerds are on that other level of intelligence, the engineers, um, the scientists, the astronomers, the ones that really go that extra level of intelligence beyond mm -hmm. just general basic stuff and college degrees. Um, so, uh, so and, and more college debt then as a result. As a result, of course. Yes, okay. yeah. But they get the jobs that tend to, you know, eliminate that right away. But, uh, and it's not to say that they also do love the sci-fi, they love the fantasy aspect of it, but they love it for different reasons. Mm -hmm. They like Star Trek because Star Trek is based in science. It can actually happen. Mm -hmm. You know, where to them, Star Wars is a fantasy because there's no noise in space. You know, that really bothers them. Right. You know, the same thing where a nerd won't. Uh, it's also very social. Geeks are very social. They can interact with other groups of people. Mm -hmm. Where nerds are kind of like, they won't go to a bar because they won't want to kill brain cells and waste money on alcohol because it doesn't progress anything for them. So nerds are less fun. Well, nerds are fun to other nerds. Like, nerds will hang out with other nerds and they very rarely break out of that little bubble that they're They'll, mm -hmm. they'll play D and D, and geeks play D and D too, but they will Dungeons and Dragons, by Dungeons the way, and Dragons for you non geeks and non nerds out there. But they'll only associate with other nerds, mm -hmm. other people who get them, and they kind of shun everyone else who's le of less intelligence because that's where I kind of was growing up as a kid. I was smarter than the average bear, mm -hmm. and I but, but I wasn't as smart as the nerds in my school. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of were like, you're not as smart as we are. You don't belong in our special group that you've been put into. What are you doing here? And of course they'd be going, and the teachers are not as smart as we are. And why do I have to sit in their class? Exactly. <laughs> and I was like, well, they told me I was smart. So that's why I'm here. So, and I can do the work that you guys are doing. So why are you picking up? I'm going to go play my Legend of Zelda watch. You know? <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. I was, I, I was secluded from the nerds, but I was also bullied by the, the other kids in school. Because right. I was also smart and I was really fat as a kid. I was about 175 pounds and about four foot four so i was kind of round i was a husky it said, <laughs> it said husky on my on my jeans that i wore and uh and i was okay with that but you know we deal with you know comedy we make we make fun of it and i use a lot of my geekdom to kind of diffuse the bullies a mm -hmm. little bit you know i was like hey look at my cool watch you know it plays video games want to borrow it for lunch time period and that was kind of like how i was able to bond with people who would not normally bond with me mm -hmm. because of, i looked different or i was different from what they were used to i went to school with a bunch of jocks Right. You know, when was elementary school. And it was kind of weird because I've never been around that before. And I love sports, but they were on a whole different level of like winning championships. They stuff. were uh, sport nerds. Sport. Yeah. Sports. <laughs> and there's a thing as sports geeks, you know, and because uh, I'm a big sports geek. You know, I love sports. I love I love soccer, football, you know, actual football. 
mm -hmm. uh, and Arsenal, and I, you know, I buy posters and you know, I wear the jerseys, and that's the kind of geek that I am. I get really into that one particular thing. And geeks are kind of like Renaissance men of our time. I say often. Okay. Uh, what they, what makes them Renaissance men and women? I, men and women, because they're they're interested in everything. You know, whether it be music mm -hmm. to some degree. Like I love music a lot. Like I'm constantly listening to music. I love new music, and but I also appreciate art. And I study. I've studied art because I know it's beautiful, and you should know have an appreciation for art. Sure. And same thing with martial arts. Mm -hmm. I've studied. I try to keep my body in a certain physical shape because you should and martial arts are important to know and as a geek you might need to defend yourself you occasionally might need to defend yourself occasionally <laughs> or you know it comes with without a, certain, a long sword and it also comes yeah it also comes <laughs> with a certain level of like behavior it's very community based geeks. yeah you know like the whole bullying thing's a big no-no like you like if somebody doesn't know how to do something you know it, you, uh, society today would kind of like make fun of them or like oh you're an idiot you know you don't know how to do that let's move on without you or in a geek community it's like oh you don't know how to do this let me show you how to do this let me show you how i did this Oh, wow. You know, because you might like my costume or whatever I'm wearing. And before, it's very elitist, like, oh, I'm not going to show you. This is mine. I, you know, it's the opposite. It's, mm -hmm. let me show you how, let me share this information with you so you can share with other people. And, you know, it's a very community. So the disease can spread. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And it's a good disease to spread, you know, <laughs> of, of happiness and community and, and, and geekdom, you know. And uh, like we, we say, like the Renaissance thing. So there's, we studied kind of like movies and books and, and we're, we're kind of well-rounded and understand that, you know, Kind of like the Greeks, you have to be a well-rounded individual to be a, a normal person, mm -hmm. you know, and to be a, a healthy member of society, you know. And you, you go to these conventions with all these geeks, and there's so much love, and so much camaraderie, and so much friendship, and it's just it's a small community, but it's so huge, mm -hmm. you know. And you'll see the same people going to all these conventions, and you'll get to recognize them. You party afterwards, and you and it, you know you get to go to each other's birthday parties, and you know so much starts to just cascade from the sure. community. It's it's a great place to be. So w was there a point that you went, you sort of had a, a, a recognition moment where you went, yep, I'm a geek? Yeah, it was kind of most recently, though. Really? If you believe it or not, because I've always been a geek. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, God bless my parents and brothers and sisters and where I grew up in a time I grew up in. Um, that It's kind of like it was like a formula, a mixture of things that were happening that I didn't know were happening at the time. You know, the introduction of video games, the introduction of... of, of good movies in the 80s and 90s like what know? like what were some of the movies that that hooked you that well like gremlins, and, and video games gremlins karate kid um big trouble little china yeah. you know dune you know i I, you know, I think of my like my 80s favorites you know the last starfighter star wars of course you know scarface you know, conan the barbarian these are movies that were like big they were they were icon they were iconic iconic pull when i was growing up i was like whoa you know i grew up with robin williams as mark mindy mm -hmm. you know i grew up with Laverne and shirley you know, I grew up with great television writing, you know, mm -hmm. great, great movie writing. And and it just came with appreciation of, of like, I don't know, track. <laughs> What's your original question? Oh, when I discovered I was a geek. Um, so all these things come together when reading comic books. You know, because when I was growing up, G.I. Joe was my comic book that I would read. Yeah. And then I picked up Roger Rabbit and Robocop and discovered there was other kinds of comic books other than just the mainstream Captain America. Mm -hmm. You know, I read Shane the Changing Man. Which was like a really bizarre. I've never even heard of that. Oh, one. Oh, dude, it's it's like it was like Quantum Leap, but uh, he would go into uh, male and females constantly, like just constantly oh, wow. switching, and it was really dark and like you know killer. And is that hit, like a DC hit, comic hit thing or Marvel image, or Image, image yeah. comics? So it was one of those bizarre like early '90s comics. Mm -hmm. And so everything that was happening at the time, and then also being bullied, is a big part of, of geekdom, you know, because because you we were picked on for what we loved, mm -hmm. because it wasn't mainstream. You know, and but then now that we're finding out that it kind of was, everyone was doing it. They just weren't talking about it. It's one of the reasons why I ask is I wonder how many people are out there that are actually. I mean, I consider myself. Um, I definitely have geek tendencies, and there's things that I that I love that are sort of considered geeky. Um, and I'm, you know, I have no problem with that. But I'm like going, I wonder how many people out there actually have a lot of that, and they, you know, they may not be willing to own it out of some weird. Uh, judgment exactly judgment is a huge thing that again a big no-no in the community because mm -hmm. i mean like people talk about uh the women you know and the cosplay equals consent which we talk about in a second but um i tell people all the time well think about the men you know how much balls it takes to walk out in public in tights mm -hmm. because superheroes wear tights you know yes and a they lot do of these costumes are if you're going to emulate the co the comic book character you're walking around even captain america looks great but he's in tights to tell you the truth. You know, so <laughs> 
you're walking out there looking at like Captain America, you're you're exposing your body to be judged by people. And yeah, you pack on some pounds. Like me, I have a special place in my heart for the fat superheroes that go out there and rock their shit anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, my my favorite's the fat Thor. You know, he walk he walks around he's two hundred pound dude, you know, out of shape as could be, but he's got his Thor hammer, he's got his helmet on, he's got his armor on, and he's posing like he was the god of thunder himself. And he and it's a safe place for him to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, like no one yeah, people might snicker, but they don't get it. You know, they don't get it yet. They don't, they don't understand it yet. You're, you're, you're Captain North and South America at that point. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, know, that guy's got Brazil going on there. Check it out. You know, and you, uh, but it's a place where you can express yourself and you get to dress up like the characters that you love, you know. Mm-hmm. We've all run around the house when we were kids with capes head around, our, head around our neck. You know, we all wanted to be that superhero. And now you can do it as a, an adult. See, to, to me, that's part of what I always thought was sort of great about what has been, you know, now known as, as geekdom um, with, you know, all the different conventions, etc. is that there is this perpetual connection to your childhood and to your childhood fantasies and having a way to remain connected to that and live that out. And the idea that that makes you, I mean, to me now it's like being a geek is actually something that says, you know what? I'm still willing to be in touch with um, the child part of myself. Yes, I may spend my days doing adult things and having a family, etc. But you know what? I've got this place over here and this time where I can go. You know what? I'm, I'm there's still part of me that's a kid, and now I get to go do that, and it becomes and and and, and that's okay. Yeah. And with, with like with me, I really do feel that it's one of the things that helps keep me young. Yeah. You know, it, it, it helps keep my imagination going. Keeps me creative. Um, in a way that's, it's kind of like, I lost my train of thought there again. <laughs> Damn it. Um, being a geek in, in that aspect, it allows you to hold on to your childhood, mm-hmm. you know, and, and be okay with that. Like, my room looks like it was decorated by a 12-year-old, <laughs> you know, and I'm okay with Cause that. Because it was. Because it was. Because, you know, in, inside of me, when I'm done doing all my business and whatnot, I do like to sit down and play a little video games, you know, mm-hmm. and, and watch some sci-fi and fantasy. And the fact that you get to stay in that realm, you know, when you when you when, you're, when you walk away from the movie, you know, mm-hmm. you go to these conventions, and you can talk to other people who love what you love as much as you love it, you know, and you get to collect the things that you probably couldn't afford as a kid, or you know, you had brothers and sisters that you know you would you wouldn't have lasted in your house, you know, mm-hmm. or you just didn't appreciate it, you know, growing up like me, I didn't have a great appreciation for Star Wars, like I do now. Mm-hmm. Even though back as a kid I had every toy out there and I wish I would have kept them, you know. But now as an adult, I appreciate it for on a different level. How many yeah. times have you seen the first Star Wars? Oh my god, it's, <laughs> it cannot be put on record. I think by the time I was a kid, I was in the hundreds as a kid because we had it on laser disc. Oh, okay. And that was like I had a my dad was so my dad raised me because he was a musician. So he, really, in the daytime he would take care of him at night. My mom would take care of him at night. So in the day we'd watch movies all day because he was learning English. He spoke nothing but Spanish, and so. Oh, where we, was he from? Uh, Mexico. Oh, huh? yeah. And so we would uh, we would watch Star Wars and Scarface and Conan Barbarian and Cheech and Chong. <laughs> Wait, so how old were you when you saw Scarface? Oh, like three. Two. <laughs> I used to be able to like say hello, my little friend. I was like a little four year old on the on the on the playground because in the eighties you played with toy guns, and I would right. like I knew all the cool lines and all the f words and oh yeah, I was a little Tony Montana all the time. He's like, what are we playing, GI Joe? Okay, I'm Tony Montana. <laughs> like, yeah. like he's not a GI Joe, but I know, but he's got the cool gun. You know, right. like, okay, go ahead, you're 21. Time. He owns the world, boy. Yeah. I tell you. Yeah, I was a funny, four, I was a funny four or five year old. But yeah, and that was my diet of, of movies. So like my parents, like I said, growing up in that time, was kind of like a, a melting pot for me to become a geek. Mm-hmm. You know? And then when you finally got a chance to own it, when was it that I finally started? Off? I think in the early 2000s, like yeah. that, when I was in college, and you know, I was. You know, my, my cousin, you know, no offense, would call me an art bag. I was going, I was going to, to art school, mm-hmm. you know, and... Where? Uh, I went to Mount Sierra a College in Monrovia. And it, it, my degree is in multimedia graphic design technology. Okay. Very geeky. Very geeky. And that's when I was kind of like... And it was a, an all-over degree. So it was film, it was Photoshop, it was photography, it was print design, it was web design, it was everything. Mm-hmm. It was a big blanket uh, degree. So and, I learned a little bit about everything. Sure. And where were you looking at, at the time? Where where were you looking to take that? Animation. Yeah. Animation was my first love growing up as a kid. I wanted what I what I thought I wanted to do was I thought I wanted to be a, a traditional two D animator. 
mm -hmm. because I can draw a little bit. And uh, I want that. I wanted to put the pages and actually create the movies. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually, what I really wanted to do, I found out through exploring through my degrees and all the various jobs I've had in the industry, is that I, I'm a storyteller. Okay. Like, I really wanted to tell story. Like I would, I wouldn't be happy drawing someone else's story. Like, I'd be like this could be better if we did this, or if we, mm -hmm. I'd be directing in my head as I draw, because that's what I was doing. I was like, this is not going to work for me. And so that's why you know, being a geek, for me especially, is one of those life veins that keeps me alive, keeps me going, you know, mm -hmm. creatively and professionally. You know, like this is something that I want to do from now until the day I die. Right. You know, I want to be a geek and. And because of the the various, you know, aspects that it involves, you know. Like what? Well, you know, to be able to be creative, you know, and like we have the show, you know, the right. TV where we're able Which to... Which we'll talk about shortly. Yeah. We get to create co sketch comedy, you know, with actors that are actually working out in the industry. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like having my own little Saturday Night Live, you know, where I get to like, hey, you know, I bring all these cool actors on and we get to create a sketch and we do the sketch and we edit it. And like, I'm doing all that work, you know, with the help of... Jan Liu and, and, and Sean and everyone from the station, you know, we're and outside friends, we're creating this unique little content. That mm -hmm. Because of the internet and the way things are now um, and technology, it wouldn't have been possible 30 years ago. And it is now. And there's no one out there to tell us, no, we can't do this the way we want to do it. We, we just we kind of have this like this open palette to do whatever we want. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of free reign. Yeah, and mm -hmm. being a geek is, is central to that because of the technology aspect of it, you know, knowing that, you know, sh filming in a green screen room is possible and where you can take that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, studying, you know, writing and studying film and studying art and all the graphic, everything has kind of landed into this moment of time of, like I said, it's kind of like a renaissance mm -hmm. in society. So is doing animation something that you think you're going to be able to bring into that? Yes. Actually, yeah. we're, we're, I'm working on some animation now. For, really? Let's show some, two, some two, uh, stop motion animation. Um, so I can consider that animation, but I'm actually considering, uh, I'm trying to figure out while well, I'm actually doing it. It's going to be kind of cheesy, uh, animating, uh, an alien into one of our interviews, you know, just a traditional 2d animation. So, mm -hmm. you know, and he delivers one line and he flies out, you know, it's just like, a one, <laughs> it's like a really quick punchline. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, and that's the thing. It's like, where because of growing up and when I was a kid growing up, I was building light boxes, you know, where most kids were, you know, out playing in mud. You know, I was, <laughs> I was I was creating light boxes so I can animate and trace. You know, pictures. so what exactly is a light box? It's what you use to what traditional animation uses to create the motion of animation. So okay. they would have the first page of the cartoon and then lay over the next cell and draw over, and you could see the movement of the character moving okay. through time. So you can lay over three or four different pages and you can see if it's fluid enough. Yeah, so it's basically a tracing box. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you know, they, I was a poor kid, and my parents weren't gonna go buy me one, and they didn't take art seriously. Going out. Whose parents do? No one does. No, no one does. In, fact, I, in fact, I challenge you to find uh, the successful creative uh, artist animator who's going like, "Oh yeah, my parents were totally there behind me." In fact, typically it's <laughs> exactly. You know, my parents thought I was wasting my time. What's your plan B? When he's like, "No," and yeah, they were always a uh, corporate America. My parents were very corporate America. Corporate mm -hmm. America. You know, and I was having this conversation with a friend of mine recently. Um, my dad was a musician, a gold record winning musician, you know, in Mexico. He had, a, he had a Spanish rock band. And he came to America, met my mom, who had her own bar at 21 years old. And he played at my mom's bar. And then they quit that and went and got jobs at like Caterpillar and SBC or Pac Bell back in the day. <laughs> and I'm there's like, a backwards American dream right there, right? It's like, uh -huh. what the F are you doing? You guys quit doing your entrepreneurial dream jobs. To go work for the man, and you know it was—it's it's a tragic story. My dad lost a quarter of his finger, you oh. know, most of his hearing from working around machines, and I'm like, Dad, and he was miserable because he resented his kids because he went to go work a nine to five when he really wanted to be playing music. You know? Gee, I have no idea what that's like, right? <coughs> and then, like me growing up, I'm like, Dad, you know what? I, now looking back, I would have—I would have been okay with sacrificing the private school. And had him work as a musician and be happy, mm -hmm. you know, rather than be miserable and, and pretty much wasting his life in a, in a factory. I think that's it's always an amazing thing where you know you will hear people talk about all the the horrible things that I did 
so that my kids could have it better. And on the one hand, I get it. On the other hand, I don't know, isn't there a way to find a balance? Isn't there a way it, it, to... That's the key. You know? That's the key. It's like, it, it, and like I was having, because I had drive for a, one of those companies that pick people up and drop them off mm-hmm. in your own car. I, don't, I can't say their name. Um, but it's... Um, it rhymes with Huber. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's one of those things where they were complaining recently because they dropped the rates and they were making less money. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was the person who was like, you guys, Think about what you're really saying. I mean, you live, you work from your own car. You're your own boss. You make your own hours. No one really bribes at you. At whatever you work, you can work five hours. You can work sixty hours. It doesn't matter. And look how much money you're making for driving around one of those most beautiful cities in LA. So how much is too much? How much do you really need to make? Do you really need to make two thousand dollars a week driving your car around? Not. I mean, what what bills do you possibly have? Maybe you need to cut back on your life a little bit. I don't know, man. Right. Right, like what habits do you really have? It's like, one, how much is enough? How much is, is too much? Mm-hmm. You know, and like, I, and like I used to have a life, you know, working for Disney, corporate America. But that was that was good. Well, I, I didn't know. What did you do for Disney? Yeah. I didn't know you worked for Disney. I was an anti-piracy investigator. Anti-piracy investigator. Yes, which is. That sounds like a full-time job. It was a full-time, very serious corporate job. Yeah. And I, I took it very seriously, and which is why I have a passion for piracy. Like, I actually don't pirate movies because I don't believe in it. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not a movie you will ever see that you don't pay for in any shape, way, shape, or form, whether it be a rental or on cable or at a movie theater. They're always paying for movies. Um, so, but anyway, <laughs> no, um, I, I'm actually, I mean, on, I mean, I happen to agree. I mean, the, the the piracy stuff, be it films or music, I mean, I get the idea that we're we we live in an age where everything is digitally available uh, for free and easy download, and hey, that's great. I can get to listen to whatever I want and watch whatever I want, and if I don't want to, I just don't have to pay for it, and ooh, isn't that great and special, because it's art, and it should be free. In fact, I had this discussion with my son just about a week ago, because he was talking about, um, there's a band called Motionless and White that he mm-hmm. loves, and I was like, oh, well, great, let's, you know, I'll get it for you on iTunes, or we'll, I'll get you the CD, whatever. He's like, no, I'll just download it for free, and I'm like, no, you won't. <laughs> and he started getting all irate about I'm like, you like that band? Yeah. Um, you want them to keep making music? Yeah. Great. Buy their stuff because if you don't buy it, they don't get paid. And if they don't get paid, they can't keep doing it. They're going to have to quit doing what you love and go get a job doing something because, I don't know, they want to eat. Nobody bought their album. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody heard it. Nobody bought it. So Everybody downloaded it for free. Yeah. Yeah, same thing. I have a little boy and his thing he's quite intelligent and his thing is uh video games. He would download video games onto mm-hmm. his Game Boy Advance, whatever thing that he has now. And I remember he I was talking to him and he was playing a game. I'm like, But wait, what what game is that, son? He's like, Oh blah 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 I'm like, I didn't know your mom buy you that game? Because she never buys you games. <laughs> no, I'm the game buyer. He's like, Oh no, I downloaded it. But I'm like, You what? And he immediately was like <laughs> I, uh, I crossed um, the line with dad. That's like, what I did. Son, he's like, that's just like movies. And he's like, I know. I'm like, okay, so you know what you're going to do, right? He's like, yeah, I'll believe it. And he, because that's the way I raised him. I was like, you know, dad's in the entertainment industry. You know, whether it's be working behind a desk or where I, I'm making movies. You know, you guys can't take what feeds us, mm-hmm. you know, because it does feed us. And, you know, when I worked at, at Disney, I was lucky enough to be at a time where they were just creating the models to understand piracy because they didn't get it that's why they hired me they're like we don't understand piracy you pirated as a kid yeah of course i did you know they're like you're hired <laughs> yeah here's here's the lesson <laughs> maybe i'll have to do this with my son um you go to like a great restaurant and you or you know or not even just let's say you go to mcdonald's and you order a meal and you order it for your son you go yeah here's this meal yeah and then you give it to the guy in line behind him yeah no he's a pirate you're not eating. <laughs> <laughs> you see how quickly that works? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, with with, uh, with Disney, when I was there, my job was to watch movies, to pirate movies, mm-hmm. to find the anomalies in those movies. So the guy walked into the crowd at a certain period of time. We would mark those movies at certain periods of time to find out what theater they came from. We could, we could do that kind of information. Wow. And we would also, I would also get downloads, you know, of, of movies from different locations. Like, okay, this pirate group or this pirate group. These are groups of pirates that just, that's all they do is they get movies and they share them and they clean them up as much as they can, put the name on them, like advertising, and they pass it mm-hmm. on who has the better pirated version. It's like a contest. Right? 
They have eye patches and yeah, pretty much peg legs and well, yeah, mm-hmm. pretty yeah. That's how most people picture pirates, you know. But like like I, Arrgh, I'm seeing the new Star Wars. Arrgh. And there needs to be a, a real education process because most people mm-hmm. think that piracy happens in the in the booth or it happens in, in transport or it's a DVD that gets ripped. Mm-hmm. You know, in actuality, it's, it happens the first week in the movie opens and it's somebody sitting in a theater next to you. But people are so paranoid that they won't look around at their neighbor. See, I've wondered about that because I'm, I'm aware of that. I mean, I've never seen it myself, but I mean, so what kind of device <laughs> does somebody use to pirate a film that way? That, I mean, I've seen some pretty amazing things from um, cell phones connected to backpacks. Really? Yeah, so they're using the cell phone screen as a monitor, and the backpack has the camera in it. The one guy had a, a arm clamp with a, with an arm, adjustable arm that came up and had the camera lens on it. No way! And the cell phone, and then they have listening devices for the hearing impaired, and they plug into that, and they jack the sound directly from that. So they'll have clean audio with video. Yeah. And That's the video, ridiculous. Yeah, the video sucks, but the audio is great. And you'll find different versions online of, you know, great audio, terrible picture, or great picture, you know, and uh, and it's taken from the guys who are sitting, like I said, right next to you. Someone could just read with a, with a camera, you know, directly into a hard drive, you know. Um, that yeah. I was kind of, I mean, and maybe this actually relates to some of my geekdom, is that anytime I've ever heard about that stuff, the idea of watching a movie that, okay, I didn't pay for it, but the video or the audio was, like, really horribly substandard, where's the pleasure in that? I mean, it's like... I, I don't get that. Audio is ninety percent of a movie experience. Uh huh. Yeah, it's a really big part of a movie experience. And you, and like I would say, that, I mean, yes, you're getting the movie for free, but you're getting a lower quality of movie. Mm-hmm. Um, your your audio is going to be messed up if you download the movie. You're opening yourself up to viruses. Um, and then the bottom line is the 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 movies that we're buying off of the streets are directly funding uh, gangs and terrorism. Really? Directly. Directly, directly, how's directly. How, I'm, I'm learning new shit here. Yeah. So how, how does it do that? It's free money for the gangs. It's free money for terrorists to be able to buy 2,000 CDs. At that point, they're half a, a cent each. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple thousand dollars worth of burning equipment. And make mass movies off of these downloads they'll get for free. Wow. Put them out there on the street and they're getting them. We're going to bucks. do a jihad. Yeah. Good timing. The new Avengers is coming out. We'll have funding in a week. It's perfect. Yeah, exactly. And they'll pay these people to carry these big bags of movies around. Uh, a dollar a movie they sell. You got 2,000 movies in their back. You can make two grand selling this bag of movies if you hustle. Wow. And uh, yeah, and they're directly funding uh, gangs, and especially here in LA, gangs. And uh, across the country, the terrorists and organized crime. Yeah. <laughs> I had a colleague of mine that was murdered in in, uh, in Russia. No, yeah. what? what? Because there is a major organized crime that are running the movie racket industry. Because they will take the it's called the telecine process, and they would take the telecine, which is basically running the movie projector straight into a digital device and taking the movie that way, and it's called a telecine. And they would take that from it because in Russia, like, hey, we own the theater, we take the movie. And they'll take the movie. They own the patrons. Yeah, and yes. so they'll take the movie, and there's a clean DVD copy of Avengers available. Well, back then it was Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, available in Russia, you know, and one of the guys in Russia, uh, who they found out who he was, was breaking up piracy rings, and they murdered him on the streets of, of, of Moscow. Yeah. Wow! And so they told us, you know, be careful. It's not that bad here in the States, but you guys are in the same positions, you know, and, it, you know, it's organized crime. It's It's... Bad guys. When that happened, did you get a raise? No, um, no. Yeah, they were kind of douches, <laughs> as as they tend to be with their employees. They were they were bad. Yeah. You know, my, our whole department was two guys, me and my boss. Yeah, and then he passed away suddenly, and then things just went downhill after that. Passed away suddenly, and he had he done anything to Russia? <sighs> no, 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 no. He was a. Uh, it was so ironic that how he, he was running a marathon. And then, this is why I would never run a marathon because the story of marathon. I'm sure you know. Mm-hmm. The di- guy dies at the end of the marathon. Like, that's why they that's why they commemorate the moment he ran 26 mo- point with 25.6 so 26 point two, whatever five, yeah a far, far distance and his heart exploded because you're not supposed to do that <laughs> yeah i think the biggest reason that i will never run a marathon is i have no desire to run 26 a fucking miles fucking marathon yeah so my boss runs a half marathon the disney half marathon ironically and starts complaining about leg pain and i had seen him that week and he would look tired mm-hmm. and he was a very vibrant and then, uh, sure enough, and he had worked out again on that Sunday and had a blood clot travel to 
his um, brain had a heart attack. Fell over out of bed. Hit his head, died. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and it was, it, was one of those, it was one of those like bam, bam, bam things. And the, 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 the department was so cloak and dagger. Like it was really cool. Like he would tell me some things and I knew half the process of how things happened. So when he passed away, I had to put everything together myself. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Okay, he told me this much and he left clues. He was a very smart guy. He left clues around his office. To like how to unlock his computer. Like he left a password written on a painting he had. You know, in the <laughs> he was that kind of dude. You know, it was very cloak and dagger. So I had to read his email. That's how I found out how he died. You know, he was confused writing on his writing buddies, running buddies about how he had hurt his leg and it was hurting. And, you know, he was feeling tired. Wow. So I, I was like, oh, this is, uh, this is probably how he passed. So it was, it was one of those sad things. And, you know, the, the, my tenure ended shortly thereafter with Disney because they wanted me to train my replacement. I'm like, Psh, get the hell out of here. <laughs> get the hell out of here. We're going to, we're going to remove you, but uh, here, train the person that's going to take yeah, your job. I was like, no. pay me. Yeah. Pay me? No? Okay, bye. Yeah. yeah so that, that was, that was hear that. over. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, but that was kind of like I got that job strictly because I was a geek. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I wouldn't have got that job if I didn't know how to download movies. I th- I think it's an amazing because I mean geeks and nerds it, it's it's always been sort of this um, almost a derogatory term, and very very nerd nerd to me is a four letter word I tell people all the time you mm-hmm. know to me that's a, one of the other n words mm-hmm. I say because I mean look at our pop culture where the movie where the words actually come from, and to me it's Revenge of the Nerds mm-hmm. that was where the nerd stamp got put onto above average out in society but booger is a geek in revenge of the nerds right if you take a look at that whole movie nerd and it's like it's a perfect example of how booger listened to rock and roll was a snazzy rock and roll dresser you know he smoked the herb if it wasn't for booger they would not gotten into lambda 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 they would not have the mega moves at the party they would not thought of the pie eating contest that won them so he was the geek who was bringing the nerds out of their nerdism and showing people like, look, these are just smart guys. There's nothing wrong with them, mm-hmm. you know. And got them out of their kind of nerdiness, you know. And then in Ge- in Revenge of the Nerds too, the nerds themselves refer to themselves more as geeks than they do nerds. I haven't seen the sequel, so yeah. um And I was like, huh, it actually ties into my. And I actually talked to um, Louis Armstrong, who's Booger. Mm-hmm. I told him he's like, I never thought about this. <laughs> I'm like, well, dude, I have. And then to me, it's clear as day. It's a very poignant, you know, social, you know, study on. Geeks and nerds. I mean, because to me, if you really look at it, a, a lot of where society has gone and grown, I mean, you take a look at the advancement of technology and the kinds, I mean, you look at all of the different, you know, phones and tablets and everything that goes on, you know, media wise. Alien. That too. <laughs> but geeks and nerds have actually created a lot of what everybody else is like excited about and loves. And is happy about, and it's like, well, yeah, all those people that you pissed on in high school, yeah, well, you might want to turn around and say thanks, because mm-hmm. uh, look what they did. The geek shall inherit the earth. Yeah, that's my like slogan right now. <laughs> yeah, um, it's very true. It, it's very true. We're we are currently the heartbeat of this planet right now. Mm-hmm. Heartbeat of a planet. Plug. I was gonna say, and wait a minute, that's another show on the station. Yeah, we are the heartbeat of this planet because we are creating the video game. Mm-hmm. The iPad games, everything that people talk about and do. The majority of the entertainment. I mean, whether it, I mean, from video games to, I mean, really the most hard hitting uh, blockbuster movies. When we say video movies. games, realize what a video game is. Your Candy Crush, your Farmville, your your game that you can't get off. Angry your phone, Birds. Your 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 boards with friends. All those games that you're playing, those are geek things that you're doing. Like like, don't fool yourself. Like I don't play video games. What are you talking about? And you're sitting right there tapping. That's a video game. Yeah, no, I, 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 th- I think there's a lot of people out there that have a lot more geek in them than they're willing to admit or they'll talk about. They'll go, well, yeah, I mean, I like doing that, but I'm not a geek. I'm not a geek. I mean, it's like, you know, sort of like going, you know, I chug a little cock, but I'm not gay. <laughs> you know, um, Exactly like that. Yeah. No, but it's one of those things where that's coming from a, a past experience with either them bullying, mm-hmm. seeing somebody bullied. Yeah. Uh, or being bullied themselves, you know, and not wanting that to be on them. And it's or being of, that bully, and, and it's kind of time to where it's where we can say, "Hey, it's okay now mm-hmm. to come out and be safe." You know, even if you were the bully, you were probably the bully because you wanted to belong and you didn't know how to belong, and you were pissed off, and so you decided to be a dick about it. 
you know, instead of just asking to like, hey, can I play that video game or I can rem- I hang out with you? I remember being really, uh, there was a, a point in middle school, I was way into Dungeons and Dragons. I was like, D&D was like, that was my after school weekend thing. And I would get crap from it from like some, some other kids. And then they would, you know, when nobody else was around, hey man, what's that game really like? What's that about? It's like, oh yeah, you might call me a name when we're at school, but truth is... You, yeah, you want to know what's going on because there is there. I mean, there there's something fun about you know about fantasy and 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 allowing yourself a time to go let that fantasy part of your mind go where it wants to go. The Great soul, things come from that. The soul needs to create. Yeah, like that's one of the cool things about I I, I really love about being a geek. And I think what I appreciate now getting older is that. I, it allows me to one stay young mm-hmm. and connected to my youth, like you said. I can, I can still be into Voltron and Thundercats and old school '80s cartoons, but there's great new content being produced by those guys like me who grew up with that stuff, mm-hmm. who were inspired by that stuff. That's why I'm so excited about J.J. Abrams doing Star Wars, right? Because he is a Star Wars fan who grew up. He's our age, and he's going to make the new Star Wars, and that's going to be amazing. And then we've got you know another at least 50 years of Star Wars content coming out. That's gonna be amazing on top, and like, I can be excited about that. Mm-hmm. And and, and I, yeah, people might point and laugh at me, but again, I really don't care. Piss off. Yeah, my <laughs> my daily day life is a lot happier than a lot of most people. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't know what it's like to be able to heartily laugh with your friends, dressed as Avengers. You know, <laughs> having a beer at Hooters, getting hit on by girls. You know, because you're because they have some weird fetish about Captain America. And yeah, that is welcome to my when life. Captain Brian. America <laughs> throws life, his Brian. mighty shield. Do I take this off? No, yes. keep it on. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, how uh, how often do you? I mean, uh, there's lots of conventions that go on. How frequently do you do you go to the different conventions? Oh God, and monthly. Yeah. At least at least once a month, and then on then. Well, and then it, it it depends on what you consider a convention because. But well, one that calls itself a convention. Because I work for one of my sponsors at Frankenstein which is a local convention that happens weekly. Oh, really? And it's free. And that's the other draw. It's completely free. So if anyone in the Southern California area is around, it's in uh, Walnut, California. It's called Frank and Sons Collectible Show. And it re- runs Wednesdays and Saturdays. Wednesdays from 3 to 9, Saturdays from 9 to 5. And it's basically the good part of the convention where the vendors have comic books, toys, T-shirts, sports memorabilia, Cards, movies, anything that you were looking for. I found my R2D2 lunchbox that I had it from kindergarten there for five bucks. Wow. You know, and you go to Amiibo Records and it's $45 for that thing. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, you can find some gems that you know, old comic books that you that you thought were lost, you probably find there. And it's I free, hundred percent free. I had to sell my comic book collection. I was like in need of I needed cash and I had to unload that thing. We've all been there, and bro. Boy. And now this is a place where you can go back and get those things. Yeah. And that's what for me it's been. Then I can great. be broke again, it'll be perfect. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> you can imagine the prices, bro. You can barter. You mm-hmm. can be like, hey, can we will and deal? Like I'll take two of these, you drop it down five bucks. Cause they're each each I do all my co- I'm on Christmas with Christmas with Christmas coming. I do all my shopping there. Huh. Because one, it supports local businesses because every vendor there is their own vendor their own mm-hmm. business they pay rent for that booth and two a lot of the stuff is handmade or unique like you can't get it anywhere else. right like a friend of mine runs geeky you which is all handmade clothing you know women's bags and boys backpacks all star wars you know geek wow. based and um and they're all family-based operation like my sponsor he's it's him and him is his brother and they sell swords you know keep you can't uh Game of Thrones swords and stuff like that. Now, I remember I had, uh, um, I sold my comics um, to, uh, there's a store out in Simi Valley called Dreamland. And uh, I sold my comic collection to uh, to the owner. And I remember um, my son likes to go there. And so we went out there once and I remember seeing uh, my Conan the Barbarian number one that was not in great condition, but in decent condition. And saw it in the display case going, that's more a lot more than he gave me for that thing. Oh, man. but i mean i knew it at the time it was sort of like i go look yeah i'm taking a bath but it's this or gas in the car right so, yeah. Um, I, i've yeah. been there yeah and like that, for me frankenstein's has been one of those places and other conventions too where i get to go and find those treasures that mm-hmm. were lost because a lot of people are in the same boat where they you know moving and lost of things you know and those I, I maybe just here in america i don't know um sense of nostalgia for the things that we were growing up with. Right. It's big here. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like we want to keep those things that we had as kids. 
You know, so that's why my room looks like a 12 year old decorator because I'm decorating those things with the things that I loved growing up, you know, which is Star Wars and Avengers. So, and so who's, is, is there, if you had to pick um, one character, like as a favorite, who do you think that might be? In what universe? <laughs> Of uh, amongst all universes, oh, just wow. just yeah. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. Jeez, Louise. One character that I had to pick across the board. I'd probably have to say Yoda. Yoda, really? Yoda's the man. All right. I love me some Yoda. Yoda and Darth Maul are like my two favorite characters, but Yoda beats out Darth Maul. Yeah, I mean, I can see why. I mean, Darth Maul's he's he's. Uh, and if you've seen the Clone Wars cartoons, uh, no, actually, even better. He, oh, really? Oh my God! As an adult to another adult, it's a great series. Really. Clone Wars is a great war series. I'll have to check that out. Even though it's Star Wars and it's a cartoon, mm -hmm. it's actually, it's got some great, great writing, which is why I'm so excited for the, for the so, movies coming out. So what about Yoda? Yeah. What, what, he, aside uh, from that he sounds like Grover. Um, Yoda knows the difference between near and far. That's good. That's good. <laughs> that's a good Yoda. I can't do a good Yoda. Um, I've always liked his, like, his shamanistic wisdom. Uh -huh. You know, kind of, he's always real chill, relaxed. You know, try to be like Yoda every day kind of thing. It's like uh, he doesn't lose his cool, you know, but at the same time, he, he is a warrior. Yeah. You know, he is somebody who you don't mess with. It was great in, uh, in uh, God, is it three or Attack six? Well, yeah. Attack no, just, um, Revenge of the Sith. It was, when uh, two. two. That was two. When he does, with Dooku, when he does a lightsaber fight with Dooku. That one, I mean, there's just, a, yeah, when you, there, there's finally that moment when, Yoda starts like going, you're going, oh, that's why he's Yoda. He's not just like this really shamanistic wisdom guy. Oh, he actually knows how to kick somebody's ass. Like hands down. Yeah, and yeah. he's that big. I love the fact, and I think it was in three, where he killed a clone trooper by like jumping up on the guy's face and like jamming his lightsaber through the guy's ch chest. Mm -hmm. And it's a, one of those things where you, I have an editor's eye and I saw it and I stopped it and rewinded to watch to see, make sure I see it. He stabbed him through the chest and like watched his eyes as he fell down on top of him. And it was one of those things where I was like, oh, he does not like, he is not happy right now. And he's like not going to the dark side, but he's, 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 he's treading that line. He's up. dancing he's, with it. He's <laughs> dancing with it because yeah. he's, um, he's not happy that young kids were killed. Yeah. You know, and it's one of those things where, yeah, you just, you just see him throw it, jumps on the guy's chest and like rides his face down into like into the ground. And, like it's so slow and like kind of like kind of scary. And it's kind of those things where you're like, yeah, you know, I try to be like Yoda, but at the same time, you know, stand up for what you believe, you mm -hmm. know, and that's kind of what Yoda's always done. And carry a tradition of, of, of excellence, mm -hmm. you know, which is what I think always Yoda strives for, you know. And like I said, you know, being a geek kind of ties into all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's be, trying to be a better than normal human being. So know? what about Darth Maul? <laughs> what, what, because Darth... he's the exact opposite of that. You know, it's, he's the mm -hmm. yin and the yang. You know, he is the absolute, and the Darth Maul graphic novel that came out in, 2002 great read and it's it, it it's the it was the first and actually his, his expanded novel was actually a good read too it, it delves into what Darth Maul really is capable of, of as a Sith hmm. you know and um, it, it just on, on a fantasy level mm -hmm. you know, it was a great story to see him you know with this full tattooed body and he takes out a complete organized crime syndicate <laughs> just because it has to be done you know it's one of those things where Dooku uh, not Sidious says you know it's, we need this out of the way because we're gonna do some big thing. It was like a prequel to Phantom Menace, mm -hmm. you know. So we need this Dark Sun out of the way because they might get involved. So we can't take that risk. So it's better just eliminate them. So if you just go kill these people, yeah. Yes. And there's this one point where he meets this bodyguard. <laughs> I can see this, Darth Darth Maul. Yes, hi. This this is Lord Sidious. Look, if you just do me a favor, there's a syndicate and they're just being a problem. Could you just go kill them? Thank you. Good night. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much what he does. Puts the call in. Darth Maul goes out there and he meets this bodyguard to one of the Vigos, one of the lords of the Dark Sun Syndicate. And she's like this witch. And she starts like reading his mind and he's so dark that it melts her mind when she reads his mind. Wow. Yeah, and you just see him look at her and it's just two panels where she reads his mind. He just looks at her with a blank stare on his face and like her eyes roll back. It's so dark. <laughs> and then she, she just dies. Wow. From how dark he is. And like I said, yeah, I guess it's just the, he's the ultimate evil. The ultimate what could happen to you, human being, if you're fed nothing but evil and bad, you know? And Yoda's the opposite, mm -hmm. you know? We're the absolute yin and yang, I guess. I guess I'm more deep than I thought I was. Ha -ha. <laughs> we've on, we've on, we've revealed something here. All right, so have to get uh, your take on this one. Um, the all-time, uh, uh, I think probably the most hated 
character in Star Wars. Jar Jar Banks. Oh, that guy. Everything happens for a reason, is what I always say. <laughs> <laughs> Everything happens for a reason. Jar Jar is a necessary evil. You know, and I think that George Lucas is a little brilliant and a little bit of a dickhead <laughs> when it comes to Jar Jar Binks. Because if you watch the movies, you will see that Jar Jar has no purpose in the first movie. He's just there. You know, he he's, does, com- he's comic relief, but he's not funny. But, but he, he's kind of one of those pivotal characters who gets the m- movie going, like George likes to do. Like mm-hmm. the, the droids are the stars of those right. six movies. Jar Jar is kind of like, if it wasn't for Jar Jar, nothing would ever have happened. They would have gotten caught on the ground and end of story. If Jar Jar takes them to their underground city, they catch a ride. And, mm-hmm. and same thing with later on in the storyline, if it wasn't for Jar Jar, Chancellor Palpatine would never have been elected because Jar Jar is the one who puts the motion up to say, right. I vote for Chancellor Palpatine to be emperor. You know, and it's like, oh, Jar Jar. So we hated you before, but now we really hate now, you. But he put all that hate onto a really hated character. Right. You know? So it had to happen. He needed a hated character. I mean, I didn't really, he was annoying, but I really didn't mind him yeah. that much. Cause I saw, I was, again, I was coming from a true Star Wars fan where I was excited to see movies that were never going to be made. Right. George Lucas had one point and said, I'm never going to make these movies. I'm done with Star Wars. I'm done. I'm moving on. Indiana Jones, everything else. And then change of heart, whatever. He came back to it. And to me, that was like, okay, great. I don't care if he craps on film, you know, it's Star Wars content. You know, mm-hmm. you know how long I had to wait for new Star Wars content. I was going crazy. So when they came out, I appreciated. I appreciated that the, it was basically a, for fans. He did it just for the fans, right? And the fans shit on him for it. And I, and I was like, that's not cool. Like, I hope he does two and three because yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, I, I I I thought he got more grief than he deserved. Although, I mean, I I was I was disappointed, and I was like, going, you know what? It could have been kinda, epic. I was yeah, I was hoping for something better. It could have been epic. Yeah. But uh, you know they're his movies. It's his story. He mm-hmm. wanted to, he wanted to screw the pooch. He did, you know. But now he's realized he can't, and he's given it off to other people who yeah. can, which is great. Good for him. I'm glad he sold it. He sold it. Yeah. Good. I'm glad that happened because now it's in the hands of a real company who's going to treat it like a real property that it can actually make real money. And I mean, we're going to have Star Wars movies to the day our our kids 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 die. Mm-hmm. You know, because there is so much content. There, yeah, out there. I mean, there. it's a, it's a whole universe. Whole you know. universers. It's called um, the Holocron. Did you know that? I didn't know that. The, the, what they sold to Disney, what Lucasfilm sold to Walt Disney Company, mm-hmm. it's called the Holocron. And in Star Wars lore, the Holocron is a is a is an object of information. So the Jedi store all their libraries and Holocrons, little glowing boxes. And uh, what they sold to Disney was called the was Star Wars Holocron, and it had something like I think they said five thousand years worth of storyline. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, different stories that never made it. Uh, different characters well, then that never made it. You know, that whole reincarnation thing better happen because there's some shit I don't want to miss out on. Right? Yeah. Oh my! I mean, seriously, we're gonna miss out on some great movies. Yeah. I mean, they could do Yoda's origin story. Right? What, I mean, that's my tattoo. I'm having a tattoo designed for my stomach. Really? Of a 50 year old Yoda <laughs> screaming on top of a mound of dead bodies. You know, with two like Jeremy um, from yeah. this Pearl Jam song. Exactly. Yes. And with 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 Yoda a long, spoken with, with long class hair. day, yeah, with long brown hair, <laughs> yeah. you know, because he's we see him, he's eight hundred years old in the movies. Mm-hmm. He was at one point in time fifty, walking up straight, walking up tall, looking good. I want to see the scene of Yoda in a bar, chicking up, picking up a chick, <laughs> right? Mm. Who knows what he did? Back to my place, you will come. Yeah, yeah. Orgasms you will have. They have screaming, a, you will do. So many origin stories they can do. So I'm excited. I'm totally excited. Back to Yoda. <laughs> Yoda the pimp, right? It was a, it was a, it was a pimp. Yoda the pimp. It was a pimp face. <laughs> <laughs> Pay for college, I couldn't. <laughs> exactly. Actually, that was a pretty good Yoda. Right yeah, there. Was, yeah, 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 yeah. See, he's got to believe in the force. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Yoda and Darth Maul, my two favorite characters. What about you? You don't have? Um, you know what? My 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 favorite star <laughs> is, um, is Han Solo, without a doubt. Really? Yeah, because he uh, he's the one that I um I. Connect with the most. Yeah, you, know? you heard about this whole Han shot first thing? Oh, in fact, yeah, I, I am, I am a firm believer. Han shot first. Um, Do you know the background behind that? Like why they changed it and why it's a big deal. The idea, what I always read was that because um, the Han Solo character had become sort of so beloved and as a hero, that having him look like a cold-blooded killer was somehow a bad thing. And I remember the first time I saw it, my whole thing was that guy does not fuck around. You know what? I mean, to me, that's that was part of his charm was that 
he was, you know, the scoundrel that that Princess Leia talked about. He and he was guy. he was dangerous and lethal. Yep. He was a pirate. And you know what? If you crossed his path, he might kill your ass. Yep. He was dangerous. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's why I'm so got you know Disney's I thought I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. they're actually going to finally release the completely with the uh, unadulterated original versions, which is about I mean uh at, which is a good thing. Lucas did the same thing. Have you seen the touched up version of THX 1138? No. Still a great movie, but like the whole car chase at the end, he adds like a bunch of additional outdoor footage. It, like he took a great movie and ruined it. Idiot. George, knock it off. Yeah, cut that <laughs> shit out. We are about to run. Speaking of knocking it off, we're going to have to knock it off because uh, it's been a, a, a fun hour of geekdom. Thank um, you so much. Patrick, no, thank you really for it was a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Man, great I mean, time. And I'm still like, so I'm like, we're just scratching the surface so much more. In fact, we'll probably, we'll be outside talking about this stuff for a few Go hours. Go your geek. Yes, exactly. Go find your geekdom. And if you don't think you are a geek, stop lying to yourself. Come out of the geek closet and pick up the remote and the joystick and have a good time and join us in fantasy land. And uh, it's fun and the water's warm. It is. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in. See you next week. It's been the Brian Crow Show. Off be the same. XSR, Excite Radio, Los Angeles. Listen to the future.